Good afternoon um, to everyone who's joined us for this book talk. My name is Karis and I'm the Arts Coordinator at the Royal Overseas League. Um, we are a not-for-profit membership organisation which has over 16,000 members all over the world. We are very lucky to have our beautiful London Clubhouse, which is places for our members to eat, drink, relax and stay. But we are even luckier to have our amazing concert hall and exhibition space, which are the main stages for our arts programme, which have been a big part of Rosal life for over 70 years. Um, the reopening of our clubhouse is taking place in just a few weeks and so we are so excited to see you all again in person soon but it's great that we are still hosting online stuff for the meantime and we'll continue to do as much as possible. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing our author today, um, Linda Porter. Linda is a British historian and author. After completing her doctorate at University of York, she then moved to New York and lectured at Fordham University and City University of New York. Upon her return to the UK, she worked as a journalist and senior advisor of international and public relations for BT. She published her first book in 2007 and Mistresses, the subject of today's talk, is her fifth. Um, and the paperback was just released a few weeks ago and we are so excited to have you with us this afternoon. Um, Linda will be taking questions um, at the end. So if you'd like to pop um, a question into the Q&A box or the chat box, I will field them to her at the end. So pop them in at any time. I think that's all from me. Oh yeah, and copies of her book are available to buy online and at your local booksellers. So please go do that as well. And uh, I think that's all from me. I'll pass over to you, Linda. Well, thanks very much, Keris. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on, on what is becoming a slightly quieter afternoon where I live in the south of England, although it's been extremely stormy overnight. And I, I'm going to, to talk this afternoon about um, Charles II and his most, but perhaps not all of his mistresses. Um, some of his more minor affairs are probably unknown and certainly would take more than an hour to, to, to include. Uh, and the mistresses are an interesting bunch of people. Uh, I, I've always thought in many respects they were more interesting than the six wives of Henry VIII and certainly most of them are better looking. Uh, and they're all quite uh, uh, redoubtable women in their different ways as perhaps I will be able to demonstrate in a little while, uh, which is in itself a, a nice uh, number of cases in which we can compare and contrast what they do. Uh, so I, I, I'll start by say, saying something about Charles II himself. I mean, he, here he is um, in uniform, um, well, in armour rather than uniform, I suppose, as a young man. Um, before sort of age and dissipation had, had really got hold of him, you'll see a portrait later on in which age and dissipation are more than a little apparent. Uh, we don't precisely know when this portrait was painted, but he was undoubtedly in exile at the time. Um, he'd fled from England during the Civil Wars in 1646 and gone first to Jersey, the island of Jersey, then spent some uncomfortable comfortable time with his mama, Henrietta Maria, and her not very welcoming family. Uh, his cousin Louis XIV was on the throne of France at the time. But at, at, the point in which I'm going to start this talk, uh, Charles was at The Hague at the court of his uh, sister, Princess Mary, who is the uh, nearest of his siblings to him in age. Uh, she'd been born just the year after him. Uh, and she was married very unhappily, having been married since the tender age of nine to um, the stadtholder of the United Provinces of the Netherlands, um, William II of Orange. So here is Charles rather resplendent in, in, in a military uniform, which he was not really able to use in any meaningful way at the time that the portrait was painted. But in the uh, summer of 1648, uh, he was uh, about to un embark on rather stormy seas himself, perhaps reminiscent of the weather we've all just had here. Uh, and he, in the, the summer of that year, had what was probably a very short-lived and um, in his mind, no doubt, temporary and inconsequential fling uh, with the first lady who's known as one of his mistresses, Lucy Walter. And they were both 18. They were probably both bored out of their minds um, by the situation in which they found themselves. Lucy was a Welsh adventuress who, like a number of other people who were perhaps more royalist outwardly than inwardly, had gone to The Hague 
uh, really to, to, to see if she could be kept and protected by one of the royalist soldiers there. Uh, she was not very well educated, but she was sufficiently able and charming to conduct herself. And she looked well on the arm of a cavalier. Uh, we don't know what she looked like during her lifetime. This portrait of Lucy uh, was painted um, after her death, or it's a miniature which was produced after her death. Uh, and we don't even know, uh, as far as I'm aware, what it's based on. It's now in the um, uh, property of the Dukes of Buccleuch, um, who are descended from Lucy Walter, because Charles's brief fling with uh, Lucy was to result in the first of his um, known illegitimate children. There are rumours that there were others and that there have been other mistresses before Lucy. Uh, but this affair was to have repercussions which lasted the rest of Charles's life and even beyond his death, because uh, in the uh, early spring of the following year, um, Lucy gave birth to a son. Uh, who was called James Scott. Um, he, he didn't initially even have a proper surname uh, and who was only rather perhaps reluctantly acknowledged by Charles and who would become the Duke of Monmouth and be a thorn in his father's side um, for much of his young and adult life. But initially he grew up in the United Provinces of the Netherlands with his mother. Uh, Lucy was a quite extraordinary young woman. Um, I suppose she was what the last century would have called a good time girl. Uh, but she had very poor judgment and she was always getting into disputes with lovers, um, uh, uh, one of whom she's even supposed to have planned to murder. She was constantly in debt. She really didn't know how to handle herself uh, very well. Uh, she knew that her son was an important bargaining chip, um, but the problem was that Charles, because he was in exile and penniless, or virtually so, really didn't have very much money uh, to uh, keep either Lucy or the child. Uh, his affair with Lucy was never really revived. Um, he did acknowledge the child, and for a while, on occasions, he saw her again, and she did go to Paris to meet Henrietta Maria and introduce her son to his grandmother. Uh, but she fell completely out of favor because she was expensive, um, her judgment was poor, uh, and it was really obvious that she wasn't a woman who could be easily or satisfactorily shut up. Uh, and eventually a, a sort of, well, not even a whispering campaign, a very strong campaign, you know, saying that this, this woman is unreliable and really shouldn't be taken up by anybody began. Um, uh, the son, little James, was kidnapped. Um, there had been previous attempts to, but finally on about the second or third attempt, he was kidnapped and brought to Paris where he was brought up, not by Henrietta Maria, but uh, uh, initially by a, a go-between. And Lucy sort of, uh, she had had another child by then, that, by that time with one of Charles's courtiers. She even came to London looking for uh, support there and was duly imprisoned by the Cromwellian regime in the tower. But eventually they let her go because they thought that she was so embarrassing to Charles that as propaganda, it was much better to keep her uh, out in the open rather than to shut her up. Uh, so hers is a sad and increasingly desperate life. Uh, towards um, the end of the 1650s, uh, she became progressively ill. We, we don't know what it was. Uh, um, James, the future James II, Charles's younger brother, put it about that she had venereal disease, but we don't actually know that. Uh, she seems to have undergone um, some sort of, not exactly deathbed, but certainly inspired by her fatal illness, uh, conversion to religion. She always claimed that she and Charles had undergone some form of marriage, but there is no record of this that survives. Uh, and if there was one, it was probably uh, well and truly suppressed even before the time of her death. So she died alone and very ill uh, in 1658 in, in Paris and was buried in a pauper's grave. So, so hers is a, a sad story. Now, by the time, um, well, uh, around the time of her death, of course, it coincided with the year of Oliver Cromwell's death, uh, Charles and the other Stuart royal family had virtually no prospect of ever returning to England. Um, Cromwell was succeeded by his son, Richard, uh, 
uh, and the disputes which had always simmered throughout the period of the English Republic between Parliament and the army came to the surface. Richard was a, a very pleasant and not necessarily incompetent young man, but he just did not have his father's strength of command or personality. Eventually, he was pushed out of the Second Protectorate. And finally, the English Republic fell apart in, in um, constant disputes. The men who followed Cromwell were made of far less stone stuff than he was. Uh, and at the beginning of January 1660, the Devonian General Monk, who had been in charge of Cromwellian Scotland, decided that the situation in England was so bad that he would see if he could do something um, to uh, at least reorganise it, if not, or bring about a restoration of the Stuarts, which he was already pondering at that time. So he and his large army moved south in the winter of 1660. And um, by what must have seemed an extraordinary uh, turn of events, because at the beginning of 1660, no one would have given Charles II any real chance of res restoration to the English th throne. Uh, with Monk's help, uh, Charles uh, was restored. He had made a very vague decla declaration, the Declaration of Breeder, in which he essentially promised he'd be all things to all men and wouldn't pursue anybody who'd behaved nastily, except for his, the, the regicides, the men who signed his father's death warrant. And so uh, I think perhaps as much to his amazement as almost anybody else's, he was uh, restored at the end of May 1660. So it's coming up for a, an anniversary of that on his 30th birthday. Uh, despite a lot of royalist propaganda, he wasn't necessarily universally well received. Uh, and a number of people um, who had clung to the, um, the good old cause of republicanism in, in England uh, survived well into Charles's reign, but were eventually uh, either forced to flee to the American colonies, where their ideas eventually bore fruit more than a century later in the American Revolution, or they were ruthlessly pursued in England and, and, and Europe and, and a number of the regicides were, were uh, rounded up and executed. Now, when Charles came back, he was unmarried. He'd had um, a number of mistresses while in exile, not just Lucy Walter, uh, and he already had at least four illegitimate children. Um, eventually, there'd be a tally of 13 uh, of these, uh, but at the time he was unmarried. Uh, he was, however, involved in a very uh, passionate love affair with this lady, uh, Barbara Palmer, born Barbara Villas. Uh, she was distantly related to the Dukes of Buckingham. Uh, the Duke of Buckingham had been James I's favourite. Uh, and uh, she was a woman, uh, as was said of her by those who didn't like her, and there were many of them, that she was a woman as renowned for her viciousness as her beauty. Uh, she was, um, I've described her as an emotional volcano, uh, and I think that's perfectly true. Uh, she had stayed with her family, her mother and stepfather, in London throughout the period of the Protectorate. Uh, and if you've ever thought that this was a very prim time in which nothing exciting ever happened and, and people led very sober and puritanical lives, um, I would um, refer you to the letters of Barbara's lover, the Earl of Chesterfield, and the letters she wrote to him, uh, which make it quite clear that there were all sorts of interesting things going on in, in uh, Cromwellian England and London. Um, uh, her family had chosen to stay because they thought it was probably in their interests to do so. But she formed part of a, a group of royalist supporters. Um, sorry, I'll just get rid of that. That's my email coming on. Uh, and she, uh, she it, we don't know when she first met Charles. Um, it's been said that she was used as a messenger to him uh, during his exile, but there's no uh, proof of that at all. Uh, she was already married um, at, at this time. She had married um, Roger Palmer, who was later made Earl of Castlemaine, but that was largely because she wanted a title rather than him. Uh, it was a quite cold-blooded marriage on her part. She had no intention of remaining faithful to him, and sure enough, she, she didn't. Her affair with Charles began almost about the time of the Reformation, 
and she became the most important woman at court uh, during the uh, 1660s, the decade of the 1660s. Uh, Pepys remarked on her frequently, Samuel Pepys, the diarist, uh, uh, and as he did a number of the ladies who uh, entered and exited the king's bed, um, he had a, the kind of interest in celebrity that people quite often have now. He also had a rather creepy interest in Barbara Palmer's underwear, uh, which he wrote about having seen on a, a washing line somewhere, um, which... Uh, I found quite distasteful <laughs> and perhaps uh, it wasn't intended for public consumption then but he was very taken by this blooming beauty as she was known. Um, a woman as remarkable for her, um, her greed and determination to get all she could out of her relationship with Charles um, as for any other virtues. Uh, she did uh, try and um, uh, um, successfully try and succeed in, in pursuing titles and um, financial support for her half a dozen children by Charles. I mean, one of the most remarkable things about Barbara Palmer, I think, is that in an age in which women quite frequently died in childbed or, and their, their, in, or their children died in infancy, uh, Barbara was back on her feet and often back at court within about two weeks of having given birth to any of Charles's half dozen children that she had with him. Uh, and she doesn't seem to have suffered in any way. Her beauty seemed to go on undiminished. Uh, the children all survived. Her last child, who's sometimes um, described as the the 14th illegitimate child of Charles II, was almost probably sired by John Churchill, Duke of Marlborough. Uh, and uh, was named Barbara after her mother, um, but she almost certainly isn't Charles's child. Uh, Barbara knew very well the importance of image and uh, how, you know, to maintain uh, being a celebrity. Uh, so uh, she had herself painted by Sir Peter Lilly, who was the leading court painter at the time. Uh, and often, um, despite the sumptuous fabrics and all that that you see here, um, these are sort of pseudo religious uh, things. So here is Barbara as Mary Magdalene um, with very much, I would think, come to bed eyes and the standard um, pearls around the neck, which appear on the ladies of nearly all of the women that, that Lily portrayed. And this is another portrait of Barbara with her eldest son by Charles, in which she's posing as the Madonna I mean, it, it, it is almost obscene in its um, uh, move towards sacrilege, I think. Um, but this is how she wanted to be seen and remembered and, and painted. Uh, and she dominated Charles and the court for most of the 1660s. But by the end of the decade, her uh, period of um, uh, domination was coming to an end. Charles grew weary of her endless tantrums. She had numerous other lovers. He had other mistresses, or was at least pursuing as well, in one case, another woman throughout this period of time. Uh, and it, it was a relationship which I think just blew itself out, really, in the end. Barbara had got what she wanted out of it. She took herself off to Paris, um, where she had a brief affair with Rolf Montagu, the English ambassador there, um, that would have repercussions as well. Uh, but she, um, she was a woman who essentially caused trouble almost wherever she went. And one of the people she caused most trouble to was this unfortunate lady, Charles II's uh, second's uh, wife, Catherine of Braganza, uh, whom he married in uh, 1662. So he had been a bachelor on the throne for two years. She was a Portuguese princess, the, the daughter of a new dynasty. The uh, Portuguese had been under the thumb of the Spanish on and off for centuries and had only just gained their independence again some 20 years or so before uh, when Catherine's father, Duke John of Braganza, was made king. Um, so this is Catherine at the time of her arrival in England. Uh, Charles married her uh, largely for the enormous um, uh, financial gain and the huge dowry. She brought with her the largest dowry of any English queen consort uh, because the Portuguese, of course, had been highly uh, successful uh, in the previous century in exploration. Their country had 
gone into a very difficult time as uh, numerous of their uh, kings died or were taken ill unexpectedly, which allowed Philip II of Spain to, to take over in the, in the mid uh, 16th century. Uh, but Portugal still had a huge empire in South America and Brazil, in India, um, in, in the Far East and along the North African coast in, in Tangier. So um, Catherine's money was very much her attraction. Uh, she, um, excuse me just a minute, I need to close the door. Sorry, yeah, uh, she had, uh, she had seldom been outside uh, Lisbon, uh, though she hadn't been brought up in a convent, as is often said. Uh, her mother was a canny Spanish noblewoman who uh, had trained her daughter quite well in, in a sort of regal um, uh, behaviour. Uh, but Catherine arrived in England um, knowing very little really about the country she was going to. She was a Catholic. And despite having promised not to, she and Charles were secretly married in a Catholic uh, ceremony at Portsmouth, where she had landed after a ghastly sea voyage, which had made poor Catherine and her, her ladies terribly seasick en route. Uh, she was in her mid, early to mid 20s, she was about 23 at the time. Um, and her, her Portuguese background and her fashions, even including her hairstyle, which you can see here, uh, were viewed with absolute amazement and ridicule in England. In fact, Charles is supposed to have said to some of his courtiers that he thought that someone had brought him a bat because of her hairstyle. Uh, he claimed that, you know, there was nothing essentially the matter with her um, visually. She, she did have quite prominent teeth, apparently. Uh, but this is how she looked when she arrived. And, and these sort of fashions, as you can probably tell if you know, have any familiarity with uh, restoration dress were completely out of keeping with what was considered de rigueur in, in England at the time. And so poor Catherine was um, already um, viewed as something of a, a weird looking foreigner uh, shortly, shortly after her arrival. Uh, she uh, probably knew about Barbara Palmer because these ladies were not as naive as, as they've sometimes been uh, suspected of. Uh, and she was introduced to Barbara um, amongst many, many other people at um, Hampton Court Palace during the course of the summer of 1662. And being unfamiliar with English and probably not quite catching Barbara's name, didn't really realise who she was until a lady in waiting whispered something in her ear, whereupon poor Catherine um, passed out and had a nosebleed. Uh, Charles thought that this was very unbecoming behaviour and was really quite uh, unpleasant to her about it afterwards. And he insisted that Barbara Palmer, Lady Castlemaine, as she was then, be included as one of the ladies of the bedchamber of Catherine. Um, I don't think she attended her very often, incidentally. Uh, and he made it quite clear, as he said himself in a letter to his advisor, Edward Hyde, that anyone who opposed him in this matter would be his enemy for life. So although it is often said that you know, Charles didn't divorce Catherine, um, which he didn't. Um, it proved that she couldn't have children. Uh, the poor woman had a, a, a condition which, I, you know, one can still have nowadays uh, and which is very rarely talked about. And in an age in which you can be trolled on Twitter and all sorts of ghastly things can be said about you, I think it's worth remembering uh, that all sorts of awful things about you could be known at court. And it was widely known that, that Catherine suffered from um, a condition that's known as um, severe uterine bleeding. Uh, she had frequent and very heavy periods and these can predispose you to miscarriage. Uh, she in fact um, had three pregnancies, but they all ended in miscarriage. And by 1670, she, it had been more or less accepted that she wouldn't ever have uh, children. And she and Charles after that led largely separate lives. She's often viewed as, as some sort of silly religious Catholic foreigner who retreated into religion and was a kind of weepy dope. But actually she forged a very independent life for herself um, after this de facto separation from the king. And she had herself uh, painted in ways to rival Barbara, even if they're not quite as sort of sensual. I mean, this is a magnificent dress that she's wearing here. Uh, and she, um, because one of Charles's 
other mistresses, as we'll see in a minute, was French. Ca Queen Catherine deliberately uh, supported Flemish and Italian painters and musicians, and she she uh, was a great patron of the arts um, and and lived quite successfully, if not always happily, I suppose, um, in a world for herself that she had created. And I think she's one of our most neglected and misunderstood queens. There is some work being done on her at the moment, um, though I think it's perhaps more academic than anything else, but perhaps it will find its way into um, other uh, other more general books. But, but that's Queen Catherine. And throughout the 1660s, she had to put up with Barbara Palmer but Barbara Palmer wasn't the only woman that, that Charles was, well, he had successfully pursued um, Barbara. This lady he pursued um, for five years, but not successfully. Uh, this is Frances Theresa Stewart. You can tell from the surname that she is an incredibly distant relative. And there were all sorts of people with the surname Stewart uh, who were um, very distant relatives of the ruling Stuart royal family. Uh, she came from a, a royalist family. Her father was a Scot. Um, her, her mother um, uh, was actually a Protestant and had had a, a son who was brought up a Protestant by her first marriage. But Frances Therese and her sister Sophia uh, were brought up in, in Paris, in the court of Louis XIV, uh, where um, Frances's mother served Henrietta Maria. Uh, and they were part of the... The, the Stuart, this Stuart family were part of the, the wider um, throng of royalists, rather as Lucy Walter had been in the Netherlands, who, who um, swam around the edges of um, the exiled Stuart court, uh, hoping to uh, gain some sort of favour and some sort of financial support. But by the early 1660s, Frances Theresa Stewart, who was then a teenager of about 14 or 15, had been in the service of Madame, um, the Duchess of Orléans, who was Charles's favourite sister, his youngest sister. He called her Minette. She is actually Princess Henrietta, and in France she was known as Henriette Anne. And Frances Theresa Stewart had been in her service. And when um, Minette heard that her her brother was finally marrying and perhaps rather unwisely given what she must have known of his proclivities even though as a lady of course she would never acknowledge these she um, offered the services of Frances Theresa Stewart to Catherine of Braganza in her household uh, sending over a note that she was the prettiest girl in the world. Uh, needless to say Charles found this rather interesting uh, not to say attractive and for the next five years, he tried desperately to get Francis Theresa Stewart into his bed. I mean, Barbara Palmer was aware of this young rival uh, and tried to sort of kill her with kindness and friendliness. Francis Theresa is often uh, thought of as a, a, a silly teenager. Uh, around the court, she was viewed as a sort of hopeless giggler who'd laugh at almost anybody's jokes, but especially uh, anybody's jokes, but especially the Duke of Buckingham. Uh, and she uh, she had pastimes like building castles out of playing cards and things like that. So she was viewed as being pretty but dim-witted. However, events were to prove that perhaps she wasn't nearly as dim-witted as people thought that she was, because um, by um, 1667, it became obvious to Frances Theresa that she could not put the king off for very much longer. He had showered her with gifts, some of which she tried to return, but some of which she'd kept. Uh, she knew that, that, you know, a day of reckoning was coming. Um, now, it so happened um, that the king's cousin, um, who was also called Charles Stuart, um, who was the Duke of Richmond and Lennox, had recently lost his second wife at this time. Um, it, it, there was no love loss between the two Charles Stuarts. Uh, in fact, Charles II couldn't abide his cousin, who had a reputation for being a sort of court rake, um, not so much because of womanizing, but because he was a gambler and was almost constantly drunk. However, um, he did uh, present an opportunity of escape to Francis Theresa Stuart, and the two, um, the Duke of Richmond and Lennox and Francis Theresa, eloped to his home in Kent, 
uh, and were married secretly uh, there. Um, when Charles found out about it, he was absolutely furious and they were banned from court for a while. Uh, the Duke of Richmond um, uh, and his new Duchess seemed to have a very happy marriage, uh, despite the fact that she'd been viewed as an empty headed idiot. Um, she proved to be an extremely shrewd and capable business manager of his many estates. And Charles II, probably in out of spite, sent uh, the Duke of Richmond uh, away uh, on various embassies overseas. And in one of these, uh, he went to Copenhagen. Um, and one very cold day just before Christmas, he was rowed out in a, a boat to have dinner on an English ship, which happened to be moored in the Sound of Elsinore, uh, drank, as was his custom, rather a few many, few too many bottles of wine over dinner. And when he came to leave, uh, and of course it was freezing cold by that time, he missed his footing and slipped between the side of the English vessel and the boat coming to take him back to shore, fell into freezing waters, didn't die immediately, but was certainly dying of hypothermia and heart failure by the time they got him back to his lodgings. So Francis Teresa was left a childless widow. There were rumours that she'd been pregnant, um, but she must have either miscarried or we don't know anything more about it. Uh, eventually, uh, not long after her husband's death, she caught smallpox. And it's really the this serious disease that, that caused um, a thawing of Charles II's heart towards her. Um, she wasn't badly disfigured by it, just left with one slightly droopy eye. Uh, and she came to court to serve Catherine of Braganza, whom, um, of whom she was very fond and to whom she was very loyal. But, but she is a, a rather splendid looking lady, uh, as you can see. There's the, the necklace again uh, in, in the portrait. Uh, by this time, uh, around the late 1660s, early 1670s, uh, Charles had um, already taken another mistress, and she is perhaps the most famous of them all, though I would argue that she isn't one of the most important. Uh, this is Nell Gwynne, the famous actress and orange seller whom Charles had seen perform in the theatre. Uh, the theatre, of course, had been closed for much of the Civil War and during the Cromwellian period, though private theatrical uh, performances did take place uh, during the whole of that time. So uh, Nell Gwynne was apparently a really quite brilliant comic actress. She was less good as a tragedian, tragedian, yes, that is the right word. Uh, but she came to the king's attention. Um, they started an affair. He set her up in a house eventually on Pall Mall. Um, she was never in the kind of coterie at court of Francis Teresa Stewart or Barbara Palmer or the lady I'm about to talk about after this. Um, but she was, um, uh, uh, by all accounts, a very um, warm hearted woman. Um, she had a wicked wit. Uh, and uh, but she was viewed at court as being vulgar and lower class. I mean, she'd grown up from what we can tell in a brothel. Uh, uh, her mother was almost certainly a brothel keeper. We don't even know who Nell Gwynne's father was or exactly where he was born. Hereford claims that she was born there, but but there's no precise proof of this. Uh, so uh, there she is looking, I think, actually rather prim, except for, as you can see, the slightly protruding nipple. Uh, which perhaps tells you a bit about how she uh, had uh, become attractive to the king. Uh, and this is another portrait of her, which is much more revealing. I mean, this is sort of a la Barbara Palmer, but without the religious imagery. Um, this is more sort of Renaissance uh, stuff. That's her eldest son, who became the elder son, I should say, the Duke of St Albans, with her in this, in this quite revealing portrait. Um, uh, but this you know, again, it is typical of the kind of hedonism and dissipation of Charles II's court. Nell's rival, uh, and someone whom she never really, I think, properly rivaled um, during this time, uh, was a French woman um, whom she gave the um, amusing nickname of Squintabella to. This is perhaps the most important and significant politically of all of Charles II's mistresses, the 
uh, minor Breton, a Breton aristocrat, Louise de Cahuel, who had also been a lady in waiting um, in uh, the court of the Duchess of Orléans. But by this time, by 1670, uh, Minette was dead and Charles uh, had taken it upon himself to <coughs> support some of her ladies. And he brought a couple of them, including Louise, back to England. She was, as you can see, a very beautiful uh, and stunning young woman um, with a very full figure and those wonderful red lips. <coughs> in fact, she's on the cover of my book in a, a version of this portrait. Uh, and she, of course, was a, a Catholic, um, which Nelgwyn was definitely not. Uh, they sort of edged around each other throughout the 1670s. Uh, Louise became uh, really a hostess for Charles uh, because Catherine of Braganza lived a fairly separate life. Charles wanted a lady who could entertain and Louise fitted that bill very well. She wasn't very bright, <coughs> but not that that mattered very much. Most um, of the courtiers and politicians at the time thought that she had political influence, though probably in practice she had very little. And but because she was constantly around Charles, she was fated uh, and um, looked up to. And people tried to uh, get her on their side. Uh, eventually, uh, of course, she too um, um, aged, um, looking rather regal here. Uh, she had one son by uh, Charles who became Duke of Richmond once um, uh, the title had passed from his cousin, uh, from Charles II's cousin. Uh, and uh, here is Louise a bit later on in her affair with Charles, um, as I said, looking very regal. But despite her hold over him and his fondness for her, he called her fubs. Uh, which was an old word for someone who was becoming tubby, which she probably was by the time of this portrait. But she, uh, she, of course, uh, her her currency, if you like, was only good while Charles was alive. Uh, and she did try and involve herself in various political things at the time without success, including in the exclusion crisis of 1679 to 81. Uh, in which James, Duke of Monmouth, had he reappeared at court years before, but an attempt was made to bar James, Duke of York, the king's brother from the throne because of his Catholicism, and put his Protestant eldest illegitimate son, Charles's Protestant eldest illegitimate son, James, Duke of Monmouth, on the throne. Um, this didn't succeed in the end, because while Charles didn't have a great deal of time for his brother James, he was a dynast, uh, and he consistently refused uh, the possibility that an illegitimate offspring uh, should become king. Uh, Louise de Cajual became embroiled in all of this and for a while backed the wrong side. Um, she backed um, Monmouth for a while, um, which wasn't a very good idea. After that, she retreated a bit from trying to play a political role for which she was ill-fitted and had little understanding. In the mid 1670s she was temporarily replaced by this wonderful lady I think she's perhaps my favorite of Charles's mistresses almost uh, Hortense uh, Mancini born Hortensia Mancini in Rome uh, the daughter of minor Roman aristocrats uh, she had led the most remarkable life before she even came to England um, she was the niece of Cardinal Mazarin the um, Italian born chief minister of Louis XIV, the one who succeeded Richelieu. Uh, and uh, she was one of five very beautiful nieces, and there were also a couple of nephews. Mazarin brought them to the French court, arranged, uh, as he hoped, splendid marriages for them because they were his family and his heirs in a way. Uh, he married poor Hortense off at the age of 14. Um, uh, to a husband who was given the, the, the title of Duke of Mazarin. He, he was actually um, the Comte de la Maillerie. Uh, and uh, he was an extremely strange man. He was strange before he married Hortense because he'd been sort of um, slavering after her since she was a nine-year-old. 
when he married her, he tried to control her completely and kept her almost constantly pregnant while moving around France as part of his responsibilities as governor of various regions. The marriage was desperately unhappy and eventually she escaped with the help of a, her brother and one of her sisters. I went to join her sister Marie in, in Italy. Marie had also run off from her husband and for a time they wandered around together. Hortense ended up in Savoy but when her protector there died, um, she really didn't know what was going to happen to her until Ralph Montagu, the um, former English ambassador to Paris, who had known her there, uh, suggested to Charles that she should be invited to England. Uh, Charles had um, put forward feelers to Mazarin while Charles was in exile that he might marry this lady and had been politely but firmly rebuffed. Uh, and However, he still obviously carried some kind of torch for her. And as you can see, she was an, an enormously striking looking woman. Um, she was uh, quite fearless. Uh, she led a very peripatetic and irregular life, um, even by 17th century standards. Um, she was bisexual and had affairs with women as well as, as, as men. When she came to England, she set up um, eventually a, a, a salon. Um, before salons were a thing, if you like, uh, with uh, another French exile um, uh, and uh, a, a, an elderly gentleman um, with whom she didn't have an affair, but who was uh, extremely um, fond of her. Uh, and um, quite a lot of work is being done on that now by uh, another young scholar, uh, Lisa Nicholson. So, you know, some of this will eventually come out in the, in the public domain. Um, but uh, she's, she's a lively and wonderful person. She and Charles conducted their affair for about a year in the mid 1670s, quite discreetly, which was unusual for both of them, until it eventually blew itself out. Um, she stayed in England, however, Hortense, uh, and um, died in 1699 at the turn of the new century, leaving behind for poor Ralph Montagu uh, to deal with uh, a quite enormous bill for gin. Um, because she had been a bit fond of a tipple as she grew older. Uh, and uh, by the time, of course, of 1685, um, this is Charles looking, Charles II, looking very different from the way he looked in the first slide I showed you. I mean, here, the dissipation, the rue, the, the years of, of cynicism, because Charles was an immensely cynical man. I've sometimes described him as an enigma even to himself. And I think there is some truth in that. Why he remains a, a sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Um, he was naughty, but, but we still like him in popular English history. I have no idea because although he did manage to stay on his throne, which is more than his brother did, of course, subsequently, uh, England was bitterly divided during his reign. Um, it was a very bad time to be either a Puritan or a Roman Catholic, although, Charles was converted on his deathbed to Catholicism, a religion for which he probably had more than a slight yen for, for much of his adult life. And uh, he, he, he was constantly in debt. In 1670, he, he concluded a secret treaty with France um, by which he sold England essentially to Louis XIV in return for a, a handsome pension. He took the money but never did anything else that he promised he would do, which again was, was typical of, of Charles II. Uh, and, and I find him in, in a way quite a, a repellent figure. Um, but um, there he is towards the end of his reign in that previous picture. And um, this is the cover of my book, Mistress's Sex and Scandal, with Louise, as you can see, on the front. And uh, I think it's probably time for me to stop now, Keris, and, uh, um, and take some questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, it's a, just a bit of Roswell history. Um, Nell Gwynne's house is um, literally around the corner from our clubhouse on the mall. And it's quite a, there's a nice blue path. Oh, right. So yes, I have been to your clubhouse, in fact, in the past, but I'd forgotten that, that, that it was just around the corner. Yeah, it's, it's just one of those things that have stood out to me. Um, if you have any questions, do pop them in the Q&A box or in the chat box. I will field them through. Um, yeah, 
Now, Gwen is possibly my favourite of the messages. I think she probably is of almost everyone because she's the, the most well known. Um, yeah. Again, she's almost part of English folklore. And she seems to have been a very warm hearted and generous woman. She left quite a lot of money in her will um, for the poor. Uh, and she was very popular, of course, mm -hmm. whereas Louise was not. The English called Louise Mrs. Carwell in a, in a a typically ghastly murdering of her name, which only we can manage in this country. Uh, and of course, there is the famous story about Nell. Um, I'm never quite sure whether this is apocryphal or not, uh, that she was traveling to Oxford to join Charles there and was stopped by an angry crowd um, who thought that she was um, probably Louise or at least someone connected with the Catholic side of the court. And is supposed to have said, be silent, good people, I am the Protestant whore. Uh, and she certainly did um, trade on that difference between herself and Louise de Carroal. But in terms of political currency and probably even her, her hold over Charles II, he was very fond of her, I think. But I don't think he had the devotion for her that he did have for Louise in the end. Yeah. Very interesting. There's a there's a play which um, by Nell Gwynn and she she really and uh, about Nell Gwynn, called Nell Gwynn by Jessica as well and she really captures the cheekiness of um, yes of, yeah yeah yeah. Um, so we've got three questions. Um, one someone asked, did all the illegitimate children end up with titles and can they be traced? Oh, yes, they did. Well, having said that, I mean, I'm not sure we quite know of, of the ones that we know of that Charles acknowledged. Yes, they did all end up with titles and they certainly can be traced because half the current aristocracy in this country are defended from them, including David Cameron and his wife and probably numerous other quite well known people, too. I mean, there there are um, I, I'm, my own granddaughters actually not on our side I should add on the, on their father's side are probably descended from Charlotte Fitzroy who was um, Charles's favorite illegitimate daughter she was one of the uh, children that he had with Barbara Palmer um, so on on sort of many sides on the wrong side of the blanket there are probably a good many people <laughs> who can claim descent from Charles II and his illegitimate children but yes I mean if, if you think of it um, the, the, some of the great noble houses, that there's still a Duke of Albans, St Albans, there's still a Duke of Richmond. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the others, but, but yes, I mean, that there are loads and loads of people in the British aristocracy descended from Charles II's the, the illegitimate children, and they were all given titles too. Okay, cool. Um, uh, I've got another question. Um, somebody asked, in those days, could a king actually be broke? Oh yes, and mostly they were. <laughs> of course they could be broke. Where, could, where would they get their money from? And in Charles's case, he had to get it, well, either from parliament or through more nefarious methods by um, doing deals with foreign kings. Um, they had um, no particular resource of their own. Yes, of course they had lands um, and they had jewels, I suppose. Um, Henrietta Maria had sold quite, or tried to sell quite a lot of the crown jewels at the beginning of the Civil War when she went to the Netherlands to marry her daughter. Well, her daughter was already married, but to take her daughter to her husband there. Uh, so, so yes, I mean, the kings were frequently broke. I mean, Henry VIII um, needed Parliament not just to... Uh, rubber stamp his reformation but he also needed them for supplies and money um so so yes they 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 were and charles was almost charles ii was almost totally broke most of the time of course he also involved england in several very unsuccessful and humiliating wars with the dutch republic um uh, despite the fact that his nephew was um the leading politician there and would of course become William III eventually. But but yes, um, kings were often broke. Um, Louis um, the 14th had many influential mistresses. Did any of Charles II's mistresses exert, la exert lasting political influence or influence um, uh, the age in any significant way? Um, I don't think they did in quite the same way, no. Um, I mean, the, the one that, that had the most uh, influence um, 
beyond um, the confines of the court itself probably was Louise de Queral. Um, uh, certainly she was viewed as having influence at the time, but Charles normally took his own counsel. So what she might have whispered to him on the pillow, he probably nodded to, but whether he actually did very much as a result of it is far harder for us to, to, to say. Um, whereas, I mean, obviously a mistress like Madame de Maintenon uh, with Louis XIV had a huge amount of influence, particularly on getting him to revoke um, the toleration of Protestants, which had been in place for a century under the Edict of Nantes. So, I, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I, I would say that, that Louis XIV's mistresses probably were more influential than Charles's um, uh, in, in sort of absolute historical terms, yes. Um, we've just got one last question. Um, you were saying you were discussing some of, Charles, some of Charles's mistresses. Oh, we've got another one just coming. Um, how many? Others were there? I don't think we know for sure. Um, there are a couple of others I haven't mentioned, one of whom was the actress Moll Davis. Um, I did have a picture of her but didn't put her on there. Um, there were a few other ladies uh, at the court at the time, perhaps two or three, but I think the ones I put on here are, are the ones that are, are most important. Nell Gwynne was a rival of Moll Davis, not just on the stage. Um, Though Moll Davis appears to have been more of a, um, a singer and a dancer than, than, than Nell was. Um, this rivalry took a particularly unpleasant turn once when um, Nell determined to put a stop to this liaison. Uh, a fed um, poor Moll Davis a lot of sweetmeats that were laced with laxatives shortly before an assignation with Charles II. Um, I think that rather put an end to the affair, probably, though uh, Moll Davis did give birth to, to Charles's youngest, his last illegitimate child, who was, for reasons I've never understood, called Lady Mary Tudor, a name which had rather perhaps difficult overtones, but that's what she was called. And Lady Mary Tudor, like Charles's other illegitimate children, um, was um, married off within the English aristocracy. I think one thing that's perhaps interesting about all of this is that um, none of his children were actually married to to foreign into foreign countries um, whether um, because there was some sort of sort of nicety that that illegitimate children were really not what you would want in your own royal family I don't know but I don't I'm not aware of any attempts having been made to marry them in France or Spain or wherever uh, and certainly um, uh, they were all married um, within the uh, within the British aristocracy. Um, Barbara Palmer's sons, for example, became dukes, the Duke of Grafton, the Duke of Northumberland. Actually, yes, these are still titles which exist in t t today, if you think about them. So, uh, um, yes, the, though I think the um, Duke of Northumberland's title eventually reverted to the Percy family because the current Duke is a Percy and they go back way into the Middle Ages. So... Uh, um, just before I get angry phone calls, I probably should, <laughs> should think about that a bit at any rate. But, um, uh, you know, there, there, there were other mistresses and there may have been some who were very temporary. But the ones I've talked about today are the, are the leading ones. Um, we've had two more sneak in if we have time. So um, someone asked, did Queen Catherine... Um, not have an important role in Portugal when she returned there after Charles's death. Yes, she did. And I'm glad you pointed that out because I should have mentioned it. <laughs> um, that there's only so much one can cover in three quarters of an hour. Uh, poor Queen Catherine was more or less detained, um, for, well, for two reasons in, in England. Um, I mean, Charles died in 1685. Um, she didn't go back uh, until nine years later, uh, 1694, having survived the reign of James II, who, of course, thought it would be very handy to have a Roman Catholic sister-in-law around as someone who could he could parade and who could support him. But then she stayed on and, and was rather miserably treated by Mary II, um, uh, to whom she had been a very affectionate aunt during the girl's childhood. Um, it was not one of the nicest aspects of Mary II's character, that I have to say, but uh, also um, uh, Catherine's brother, um, King Pedro, uh, 
for reasons that aren't really clear, uh, except that, you know, there is a general tendency for a long period of time uh, not to want um, a widowed or divorced spouse back in your country, because what do you do with them? Um, but Pedro certainly didn't want her to come back until, you know, there was absolutely no alternative. The interesting thing about her return is that she decided to go overland through France, whether that was a memory of the ghastly voyage she'd had all those years ago, we don't really know. Uh, and she was very surprised and gratified to be treated with a great deal of courtesy and consideration as she went down through France by order of Louis XIV, um, because she had been quite anti-French in, in her time as Charles's queen. Uh, and she lived quietly um, in Portugal until um, the year 1702 to three, when Pedro became too ill um, to rule by himself and his son was too young still um, to, to uh, take over the reins of power. So for barely a year, Catherine of Braganza acted as uh, regent uh, in Portugal, a role which she seems to have performed with a great deal of ability and aplomb. She negotiated a new trade treaty, for example, with England, which was important to, to both countries at the time. And she died um, right at the end of the year, 1702 to three, <clears throat> actually just before midnight on December the 31st. Uh, she was 67 years old at the time. And I, I think hers is, a, as I said, a much underrated and very interesting life. Mm. Someone was just stuck in saying, did she introduce tea to England? Yes, she did. Yes, she did introduce tea to England. Um, well, she introduced tea drinking as a uh, acceptable and even, you know, desirable social habit. Tea had been in England already before Catherine um, came here. Uh, but it was viewed as a sort of vile medicinal concoction, which nobody would really want unless they had to. Coffee was drunk quite freely, but, but not tea. But Catherine brought with her not just um, tea, um, of course, from the connection with Bombay and India, but a, a whole sort of new um, outlook on, on what we would call interior design, you know, beautiful um, uh, furnishings uh, and um, mirrors and, and um, wicker work and all that sort of thing from Portugal's international um, colonies. Uh, and these actually did mean that, that as far as Louise de Cajoual was concerned, she could compete, you know, as somebody who was viewed as a, a fashion setter and, a, and, a per and an arbiter of taste. Uh, yes, she uh, she did um, make tea drinking popular in in England, and it caught on very quickly. Um, so I think we're just the last question. Um, you mentioned you've mentioned letters. Um, where are the primary sources that you have used for the book base? Are they a private mixture of private archives or national? Archives? Yeah, they are a mixture. Um, um, some of Roger Palmer's papers, which have a relevance, of course, for for his wife Barbara. Um, are, are in, in a private collection um, near Windsor. I'm trying desperately to think of the name of the house and it isn't coming to me, but, but perhaps it will in a while. Um, the rest of the, the things that I, uh, the, the sources I used are either at the, the National Archives or the British Library. And there is a lot of primary source material available in print for this period. I mean, having worked in both the Tudor and Stuart periods, um, there is so much more uh, stuff that's available in the 17th century, just because, you know, it's closer to us in time and has survived better. It is also for, for a historian whose eyes aren't getting any uh, younger, mercifully a lot easier to read than the Tudor hand. I am now for my next book going back to, to the Tudors and, and I'm going to have to go back to Scotland as well. And if anyone who's ever read the Tudor secretary hand thinks that, that, that it's not easy to read, I can assure you that the Scottish secretary hand of the same period is a whole lot worse. Uh, but, but yes, there, there is a vast amount of material. And um, the, the papers, for example, of um, Frances Theresa Stewart, uh, covering the whole of her time as, as the Duchess of Richmond and her prolonged dispute with her sister-in-law after her husband died, you know, as to who should 
manage the estate. He died in debt, but, um, it, it, you know, there, there were a lot of legal wrangles afterwards. Those are all in the West Sussex record office in Chichester, which is a super place to work. It's absolutely lovely. I've worked there for, on, for several books, actually, on different things. So um, the, those papers are all there. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think whether there are other private papers that, that I, I used. Um, there probably are a few, but I can't immediately think of them. But, but the majority of stuff is, is in um, the British Library or the National Archives. Amazing. Okay, thank you so much, Linda. Um, I just, if there are any more questions, I'd suggest everyone go buy her book. I'm sure there are crowds <laughs> of them in there. Um, uh, but I think that's all we have time for this afternoon. So okay, well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for some very good questions. Okay, I'll say goodbye now. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye.